Hillside. Uh, well, today uh, I'm in Ohio. We just got here um, at my parents' house ready for our Christmas round two this evening. And um, But I just wanted to um, share with you the final installment of the Seven Women book. And this week, the last chapter was on Mother Teresa. And well, I'm uh, sure that you know of Mother Teresa, I'm just going to give you some of the details and, uh, and then what, you know, I've learned from her life. And so she was born in August in 1910, uh, and it was in an area that was a part of the Ottoman Empire. And so 90% of her neighbors were Muslim growing up, and then the other 10% were Roman Catholic, and including her family. So she was raised Roman Catholic. And um, her daughter, or her father died when she was very young, um, uh, like eight years old. And, and so it really put the family in, um, in to poverty. But however, or even despite that, and in the rough times, her mother always continued to care for the poor and the sick around them. So it was really ingrained in her from a young age. And her mom took them to church, the kids to church daily, and they sang and they prayed every day, every evening. And um, just from a young age, uh, Mother Teresa was a natural leader and an organizer, and it was at 12 when she had the first inklings of God calling her to religious life. And at 18, um, she said that she was meant to be belong completely to God. Um, so it was just a lifelong devotion to serving him. And so um, she learned about a local from a local priest about the Society of Jesus and um, the situation in India, specifically in Calcutta, and she wanted to join them. So she applied um, for the Sisters of Laredo and um, to um, to join the convent and uh, the service. And she left her family in 1928. She spent six weeks learning English, and she was off to India. Um, she was shocked by what she saw there. She, even though she had been poor and seen, um, you know, poverty in um, Europe, she realized that she had no real idea what true poverty could look like. Um, families were in the streets. People were virtually naked and. Um, and when she started serving there, she first taught in schools and she assisted nurses, nursing staff at a, a medical station. And um, there was a, a quote um, that said, when a man brings an emaciated child to the medical station, um, she explain, or he explains that he is afraid we will not take the child and says, if you do not want him, I will throw him into the grass. The jackals will not turn up their noses at him. So this was the situation that she was in. Um, people would just throw their babies out um, and, or the children and... Um, if they couldn't care for them and so she and she also made in addition to teaching and, and working at the medical station She made weekly visits to the poor who were in shacks and she called them um, wonderful people and she it, and Seeing them and working with them just reinforced um, The belief that she had that you could be truly and deeply happy um, despite not having material possessions um, and then in 1946 she was dealing with a bout of tuber tuberculosis and they forced her to um, rest more and um, send her on a retreat and it was on the train to the retreat that she heard um, God's call to go out into the streets to help the poorest of the poor. So she went to the Archbishop with a proposal to start a congregation that would live among the poor entirely reliant on God to provide for their needs. Um, she wanted to go to them to the poor rather than letting them come to her. And so um, a couple years later she was given permission to try it for one year. So she set out with just five rupees, and um, and she spent three months studying um, treatment for um, diseases that um, she would encounter that they suffered from, and um, basically the first day just went out and found some children and started teaching them the Bengali alphabet um, on the the mud in between some huts, and she went on to um, she taught at this little school uh, the alphabet, catechism, hygiene, other skills, and um, they she also. Um, would take the kids to visit the sick and the kids got things like soap was a prize um, and the locals uh, who heard what she was doing started giving food and money she was able to rent two huts one for school and one for sick and dying she would visit the local pharmacies and go in and say would you like to do something beautiful for God and uh, if they said yes or when they said yes she would give them a list of medicine that she needed and um, uh, she didn't get a lot of help from hospitals because they would refuse the patients because knowing that they wouldn't be able to pay. Um, so it was rough going. And so these were really the worst off, the people who are worse uh, off of anyone, you know, people who um, uh, needed, who were on the verge of death, you know, really. And so um, she went and kept going into the slums, providing food, simple medical care. Um, this is really what, as as other nuns um, began, in, began aiding her in her um 
in this mission. Um, she, yeah, they would go into the slums, provide food and simple medical care. They would visit the elderly and really just giving comfort to people who are abandoned, just showing them um, a little bit of love and whatever they could in any way that they could. Um, ta they taught children letters and hygiene and um, yeah, she thought that the biggest problem on earth was um, being unloved. And so um, that was really her goal, just to go out and show that every person should experience love. And um, the city, after, um, as they continued this work, gave them a hostel, a filthy abandoned building next to a Hindu temple. And the sisters cleaned it up and really just made it a place to offer the, the very, very sick, just basic care, love, and a place to die with dignity. And um, Hindus, being it being next to their temple, um, were upset that Christian nuns were working, you know, right there. And they started violently protesting. Um, but the women invited a leader, one of the leaders to come in to show them what they were doing. And, you know, after he saw what they were doing, even they couldn't uh, deny the good that the nuns were doing. So um, they really held to that commitment of not only serving the poor, but living as one of them. Um, they lived in, you know, just a shack, you know, boarding house with the basics, most basic things. And they washed themselves and their clothes each morning in a bucket of water. They used ashes to clean their teeth. Um, just holding to this determination to be completely dependent on God. And it also meant that they expected miracles. Uh, and my favorite example was one time in which they had no food to feed the 7,000 people dependent on them for the next two days. And in a crazy coincidence, the government shut down the local schools for those two days and all the bread that would have fed the kids, they donated to the nuns and their organization, the Missionaries of Charity. Um, so just some miracles like that and the way that God provided. In 1955, they opened their first home for sick and unwanted children. Some of the babies um, brought to them had been dumped in garbage cans or drains. And um, a central, um, just that central motivating belief that uh, of Mother Teresa that no child should die without having experienced love. So even the ones who died quickly after coming, um, arriving there, you know, she said they deserve to die beautifully, even if they just held them, you know, closely um, and just so they could experience seeing that before passing and those who did not die they taught them skills so that they could work once they left and they wouldn't have to live on the streets um, and so um, also part of this um, wanting to care for those children who were left um, you know it also had this this drive of um, she wrote authorities and hospitals in an attempt to end abortion she promoted and organized adoptions to prevent mothers from aborting you know unwanted babies and um, so then she also discovered that there were 30,000 people suffering in, with leprosy in Calcutta alone. And since most people were ignorant about the disease, they feared it to the point that employers would fire those suffering and families would reject, reject them. So they were totally on their own. So Mother Teresa opened a leper asylum. When it got shut down because of a government development plan, she was able to use a donated ambulance to make it a mobile leper leprosy clinic. And that was even better because they could go to people who couldn't leave their homes or um, people didn't have to stop working in order to get care because they could come to them. Again, they taught skills that could help these people to become self-sufficient so they didn't have to worry about losing their job. Um, and um, they began expanding um, their organization, the Missionary of Charities, in 1959 to other areas of India, and then in 65 they went beyond India. Um, and then there was other branches of the ministry for men and for lay people. Um, but then in Western cities, she found a different. They had different problems: drug and alcohol addiction, mental illness were the problems that she faced. And she realized that while these nations weren't materially impover impoverished, they suffered from what she called spiritual poverty, poverty of the spirit, of loneliness, of being unwanted. Um, and so she began to tackle that. And so with the growth of the ministry came press coverage, growing fame. Um, but that also brought criticism. Some people wondered why she didn't uh, attach or attack the institutional structures that cause poverty. Um, you know, you could do, she could do so much more. Um, she responded to that, that God required her to do small things with great love. And I loved that. Um, while the government welfare programs existed for admirable purposes, she said, Christian love is for a person. So she was more um, wanting to make that real, like, love um, and personal connection with people. Um, she worked on the individual lover, level. The government, you know, they can give you food or money, but they can't give you love. Um, and on the other side, there were people who wanted her to do more witnessing with the teachings of the church. Um, however, she was in a tough place being in a Hindi, Hindu country. 
Um, and she also said that she preferred to let the work itself do her witnessing. Um, Matt, you know, Matthew 5, 16, let them see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven. Uh, as she was recognized later in life and honored and rewarded, she reminded everyone that taking care of the poor and hungry was not heroic or extraordinary. Um, it was, quote, a simple duty for you and for me. Uh, in 1979, she received the Nobel Peace Prize, and she accepted it in person and, of course, proclaimed her faith in her uh, uh, acceptance speech, and she spoke about the spiritual poverty. She attacked the violence of abortion, and I love the ex excerpt um, in which she was reminding the uh, audience of the humanity of the unborn baby. Um, she said, It was that, that unborn child that recognized the presence of Jesus when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, her cousin, referring to John um, the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb when he leapt for joy as soon as Mary came in because he recognized the Prince of Peace. Even that unborn baby in the womb recognized that and leapt. Um, and... She later went on to speak against abortion again at a national prayer breakfast during Clinton's presidency, saying that the greatest destroyer of uh, peace today is abortion, because Jesus said, if you receive a little child, you receive me. So every abortion is the denial of receiving Jesus. Um, like, wow, po just powerful words and unafraid to say these things. Uh, in 85, she learned about the AIDS epidemic in America and how they were basically treated as the lepers had been in India. And so she opened the first hospice for AIDS uh, victims in New York. Coming to the end of the, her work, she wrote in a letter to all involved in the missionaries of charity of the, quote, joy of loving each other and the poorest of the poor. Beautiful are the ways of God if we allow him to use us as he wants. Um, she later, she died in 1997 at the age of 87 and was honored with a state funeral in India and hundreds of thousands visited her as her body laid in state from the incredibly poor to royalty and political leaders. Pope John Paul II himself wrote a message to be read at her funeral. Um, she made a massive impact and uh, left an incredible legacy of thousands around the world continuing her work simply by um, that what, how she said, doing the small things with great love. Uh, I love that so much. In um, 2003, she was beatified by the Pope. Um, and you may find it shocking that um, after her death, examining her journals, they found that she, too, struggled with experiencing um, what she called spiritual dryness um, later in her ministry. She didn't feel the, um, she said, she didn't feel the proximity of God in the same way. Yet she still approached her work with joy and a smile. Um, she really personified personified the ideal to love God and to love your neighbor. And I love that what she did was so simple that each one of us can do it. Um, and she said, in fact, we uh, must do it. Act or this is what um, Metaxas wrote. He said, in fact, we must do it if we are to obey the commands of Christ, to feed the hungry, care for the sick, invite that stranger in, clothe the naked, visit those in prison, and quench the thirst of those who simply need a cup of water. Um, he also said that it was constant prayer that gave Mother Teresa that strength to keep going, uh, even when, you know, she felt the spiritual dryness or she was living in these, um, horrible conditions. And that's what caused her to produce so much fruit. And, um, prayer that, you know, is, has to, un, um, you know, come under that effort to, uh, to obey God. Because, um, as Mother Teresa herself would be the first to say, obedience always isn't always easy. And in fact, without God, we, it's impossible. Um, we need him in order to, uh, to live out his commands of, um, caring for people. And, um, the, you know, the passage in Matthew 25, 34 to 40, where, um, God says about, or where Jesus says something about, about, um, you know, you, you saw me, um, hungry, you fed me and you clothed me and all these things and you brought me in. And, um, and when they say, when did we see you? And he says, um, anything you did for the least of these, you did for me. And that really um, can personify or, um, or exemplify her what her ministry was and what she did with her life. So, um, yeah, I just love that, you know, when we've talked about some women in this book who um, took up these huge causes and um, spoke out to make, you know, large changes on like national levels, whatever. Um, and that is great. And that's such a necessary thing. And then on the other side, Mother Teresa saying doing the small things with great love, but it left this huge lasting impact. I um, mean, that way of just expressing God's love to someone and, and um, allowing them to have that experience as you know, everyone needs that in their life. 
um, because sometimes that might be the only way that someone experiences the love of God or first is faced with the love of God. Maybe it's through you of showing that to them. So I just wanted to offer you that today, and um, I hope you've all had a Merry Christmas and are um, looking forward to a Happy New Year, and um, we'll see you next year.